So there's a few things about digital signatures. You can think of them as sort of trivia items that I want to mention. Uh, they end up being relevant to Bitcoin for purposes that aren't really central to Bitcoin. So they're sort of on the side. Uh, but also you, when you talk to people and have discussions of, uh, about Bitcoin and the signature function that's used in it, uh, these are, are sometimes this is good information to know uh, based on what might come up in a, a particular conversation. So the first thing I'll note is that say we have a signature on an algorithm. Um, so we have a message. Here's our signature. And this is using some public key. So I'll, I'll just consider the public key as part of it. Um, generally, what happens is uh, on occasion, uh, so the signature, I'll just remind ourselves that the signature function, uh, sign function, is what produces the actual signature itself. Uh, it's going to take a message, it's going to take a randomness, and it's going to take some secret key. Okay. Now, generally what will happen is you'll usually only sign one message once, right? So you'll sign a message, and then tomorrow you might sign a different message, you might sign a different message. And so what's changing in that case? So your public key is always the same, or you're always using the same secret key. And what's really changing is M is changing. Uh, R should always change. And so as a result, the signature will also change as well. Okay, so the normal case, um, so in the normal case, what happens is uh, you'll sign uh, some message that's different than the previous message. You'll use randomness that's different. And uh, you'll use the same secret key because it's still you signing it. Okay, and if you happen to do this, uh, then what will happen is you'll end up with a totally different signature, okay? Uh, so these are two signatures on uh, different messages. Now, occasionally, there's no problem uh, if you want to sign the same message twice. Okay, so sometimes you might sign uh, a message. the same message. And since it's you signing both of them, you're going to use the same key. And the trick here is you have to be really careful that if you sign, if you sign the same message twice, uh, what you want to do is you want to use different randomness. So that's what randomness means. It's a, it's a number that's chosen every time you do the signature algorithm. You don't remember the randomness you used previously. And so with high probability, these are going to end up being different uh, numbers. And if that's the case, then the signature will also come out different. Okay, so there'll be a difference uh, here. So these will be diff. This will be the same. This will be the same. And these will be different. OK, now what can go wrong is and, and there's instances of this that we'll circle back to. But uh, the way that digital signatures are used in Bitcoin, uh, you have to get these random numbers from somewhere. And that's a computer. So your computer is generating random numbers or your phone. And it's actually really tricky for a computer because a computer is purely deterministic. It doesn't have a source of randomness. So it has to kind of simulate randomness uh, based on, you know, usually user types of things like user entries you know, swipes on the screen or the exact intervals between typing. And it uses some other things like when the operating switch system will switch between tasks. And there's a bunch of ways that it pools randomness together. And then it makes some estimates about entropy, tries to clean it up, and then tries to expand that randomness out for all the cryptography or other applications that, that you need randomness for. Um, and so it turns out that that's tricky to do. Uh, sometimes when, when developers write software apps, they're not really attuned uh, to, to the, the consequences of not doing that correctly. 
uh, or not calling the right libraries uh, that are going to do this correctly. And so you can end up in a scenario where the same randomness actually gets repeated. Uh, you might have to generate thousands of signatures to see it, but you know eventually uh, you will end up with the same randomness. So let's consider what, what happens. So this is an abnormal case. And you use the same randomness. And we basically have two cases. One case is we're, we're signing the same message with the same randomness, and the other case is we're signing different messages with the same randomness. So let's consider the first case. So this is what our first signature looks like. Uh, our second signature is going to be on the same message using the same randomness, using the same secret key. In this case, because sign is deterministic, if you it has the exact same input, it's just going to give you the same output. Okay, so the, the signature will come out, it will be the same. And even though this isn't ideal, there's no danger in doing this, um, you know, because this is already a public value. So if you copy and paste this public value, you can make as many copies as you want. And so the fact that, that you're basically producing another copy of the same data is, is kind of irrelevant. There's no uh, security vulnerability uh, in that particular case, okay? But where we really get into trouble is if the message happens to differ, so let's say you sign one message with randomness R and using your one secret key, and then later you, okay, so because it's you, you're using the same secret key, you come along and you sign a different message and uh, you use diff, or sorry, the same randomness as before. So this is the same, this is different, Uh, your key is the same. The signature that comes out will be different, okay? Because you used uh, because the message was different, that creates some difference across these two values. Uh, so they'll be different. But um, if someone's able to observe, and it turns out that by looking at the signature function, you can see that they use the same randomness. The randomness is not in the signature itself. So these signatures have a handful of values. Uh, but one of them is, is a very direct conversion of the randomness into another number. And so by just looking at the signatures yourself, you can actually pick up on the fact that someone used uh, the same randomness twice. And it turns out that, and this is just, it's not general to uh, digital signatures. So a lot of digital signatures do not have this property. Uh, but in the special case of ECDSA, as implemented, there's even ways of cleaning up ECDSA, but um, as implemented in Bitcoin and as well as, as um, other applications uh, that use ECDSA, like signatures on certificates and that type of thing. In this particular case, <coughs> what will happen is if you use the same randomness, you can actually do a computation uh, where you compute, um, you take as input the two different signatures, the two different messages, the same randomness. You don't know the secret key and you can actually invert out what the secret key is. Okay, um, so to put this very um, just sort of non-technically, uh, this will leak uh, the secret key SK. Okay, and so you don't have to understand why. Take a crypto course if you want to see why. You'll see how uh, to actually do this computation and, and why uh, it works. <coughs> Excuse me, but for the purposes of this course, um, the most important thing is that this can happen. Uh, and not only can it happen, it has happened. In Bitcoin and we don't understand what the consequences of this is for Bitcoin yet because we haven't looked at Bitcoin so we'll circle back uh, to this attack after I give you the details of Bitcoin but I just want you to note for now that if you have a digital signature like ECDSA you sign different messages with the same randomness uh, it's going to leak your secret key and so you have to be very very careful about that okay so that's one sort of weird property okay uh, a second thing uh, that we noted about signatures is that the message can be any length. Okay. 
Now, it turns out that this is sort of true, sort of not. Uh, there, there's, there's a little nuance to, to why this is the case. Um, so the signature scheme itself, it's implemented over a finite sized group. So the, the numbers that are involved in it, including the signature that comes out the other end, are all finite. And the slot to stick the message in is also finite. Okay, so you can't you can't actually take a big message like the contents of your hard drive and actually put it directly into the signature function. It won't fit. Okay, so it has to where where you pull the message in. It, it you're looking for something that's fixed size there. Okay, so what you do instead is we do this thing. We call it the hash and sign um, paradigm. And because hash, a hash of a message is a unique fingerprint for the message, what we can do is we can first take the data, we can hash it, and then what we do is we sign the hash of the data. Okay? And so, and that's just as good as signing the data itself if the hash function, it's really hard to find two messages that produce the same hash. In, in other words, collision resistance, whether weak or strong, is, is, um, is strong. We don't care actually about pre image resistance in this case. Um, because uh, the hash input, the pre-image that we would hide would be the message, but we already have the message anyways. We need the message uh, because we're verifying the signature on the message itself. So uh, we, we only care about uh, the collision resistance uh, of the hash function. Um, but anyways, so this is how a signature works. So in general, you sign hashes of messages not the message directly. And in some signature functions, these are two discrete steps. So step one is you hash the message, and then step two is you stick the hash into the signature algorithm. Uh, in ECDSA's case, um, there's already a hash function that's being used, and so you just kind of add the message into that hash that's already going on. Uh, so you don't have to explicitly hash first and then sign. Um, where you put the message into ECDSA, there's already a hash that's going on. Um, and so, so you, you, it's sort of streamlined. Okay, That detail doesn't really matter. Uh, the key property here is, let's say you were able to break the collision resistance of the hash function. Uh, you were able to find messages that hash the same thing. Then what you could do is, if I can get you to sign one of the two messages, right? then uh, if I hash the other message, it ends up being the same hash value. You're signing that hash value, not the original message. And so your signature on the first message ends up inevitably being a signature on the second message as well. Okay. Now in ECDSA, there's also some complexities because you're not, when you hash the message and you sign it, there's some other stuff that's getting mixed in. Um, so it's not quite that simple of a story uh, for ECDSA as compared to other signature algorithms like RSA, which is which is used, uh, which is used a lot, but th this is a real attack. So people have, you know, we used to sign with MD5, which is an old hash function that we talked about being insecure against collisions, and so people were able to break um, uh, signatures not by breaking the signature itself. They just they attacked the hash function, and because you were signing the hashes of things, uh, if you find collisions in the hash, then you can kind of lift signatures. Uh, off of one message and put them on another message. Um, so anyway, so so the fact that you're signing hashes is, is, is somehow pertinent. Um, and then the third thing is I mentioned that in ECDSA, the message comes into the hash directly. So I just want to give you some intuition. Once again, we're not going into the details of the algorithm itself, but I want to give you some intuition as, as to what's kind of happening under the covers at an intuitive level. So there's another type of cryptographic protocol, something that we will talk about much later in the course when we talk about use cases. Um, and some cryptocurrency alternatives to Bitcoin use them extensively. Uh, but there's this thing, it's called a zero knowledge proof. And the idea of a zero knowledge proof is uh, you have some secret and you wanna prove something about that secret to me without showing me that secret itself, okay? And you're, the only thing that you'll prove is exactly what you set out to prove. And so the, the thing that releases the most, the least amount of knowledge 
Um, this is why it's called zero knowledge because you get zero knowledge beyond what it is the statement that you're trying to prove. Okay, so you have this sounds sort of abstract, um, but a very common zero knowledge proof. Uh, one of the simplest is just to prove that you know a particular value. Uh, so you're not proving anything about the value. Uh, you're just proving that hey, I know that particular value. And so a common zero knowledge proof is one where um, you have a public key and you're going to prove to know uh, SK that belongs to PK. Okay, so I have a public key. I'm going to prove to you that, I hey, I know the secret key that belongs to that public key. In other words, it's my public key. That's sort of the equivalent statement, okay? And what you can do is you can do some math um, And it only proves that you that the statement is true, that you know SK, and it doesn't doesn't leak any information. So zero information about SK. It's not like I know SK, so I'm going to show half of it to you, and then you know because you see half, you're going to believe I have the other half. Well, no, no, that leaks half of the information about secret key. So this proves that you know SK uh, without leaking zero information about it. Okay. And how these work are kind of complicated. You know, when, when I teach the crypto course, it takes a long time before we can sort of build up, um, build up to this particular proof. So uh, who cares how it works? It's magic. Uh, it doesn't really matter. And uh, there's a very common way of doing this. It's called the Schnorr zero knowledge proof. Uh, sometimes it's called the Sigma protocol. And uh, so Schnorr is, is this proof uh, that, that basically you have a public key and uh, you're going to prove that you know the secret key. And Schnorr is tied specifically to a, a public key system. So it, it works in the DSA setting. It doesn't necessarily work in, in other settings, but there's equivalent proofs that do. So we have the zero knowledge proof. Okay. Now all a signature scheme is, is you go and you issue one of these proofs. You say, hey, I know the secret key that belongs to this public key. And inside of this proof, there's a hash function that happens to be used. And so what you do is you just hash your message in while you're doing this proof. In other words, you staple this proof to a message and that's what a signature is. So mechanically, if you want to understand sort of philosophically, what, what exactly is a digital signature in cryptography, at least in the ECDSA model, there, there's a different model that RSA uses, but in this model, it's, I'm going to prove to you that I know the secret key uh, that corresponds to a public key and I'm going to staple that proof to a piece of paper that has some data on it, right? Um, I'm being analogous, obviously you're not physically stapling it, you're doing this digitally, but you're going to staple those two pieces of information together and that's a signature, right? Because the only person that could have issued that statement or that proof is the person that knows the private key and because they're the ones that chose the message to include, then they're kind of endorsing that message as well, okay? So anyway, so once again, this isn't a, a really critical piece to get, um, but you have a Schnorr zero knowledge proof and uh, inside of it, there's a hash. And uh, if you include the message in the hash, then voila, you have a signature. Now, technically, if you start with Schnorr and you do this process, you're going to end up with something called a Schnorr signature. Um, so the signature type that you'll end up with is, is actually a Schnorr signature. And DSA is a very close relative If you look at them line by line, they're almost exactly the same. There's only one line that's that's different. Um, anyways, and they, you know, there's no reason to think that this is more secure than Schnorr. And it turns out that Schnorr is actually a little simpler. Um, 
And if you want to do things like prove the security of your signature mathematically, Schnorr is a little easier to work with than DSA. And since there's no reason to think that DSA is stronger, Schnorr, so it's kind of cleaner. And then there's fancy things that you might want to do with signatures that, that maybe we'll talk about at a future lecture, I'm not sure, but there's these things called threshold signatures or there's different variants like blind signatures, group signatures. You know, there's a whole slew of kind of fancy signatures and it's a lot, easy to, a lot easier to ba uh, base your fancy signature on just a Schnorr signature than a DSA. So why am I mentioning all of this? Uh, there is a conversation right now uh, at the time that we're doing this, that I'm recording this lecture, so it's 2018, about maybe switching from DSA to Schnorr in the context of Bitcoin. Uh, but, but anyways, uh, and I should mention the EC variants of both, so EC DSA to EC Schnorr. Um, but anyways, that has not happened yet, uh, but it's something that you hear in the Bitcoin community, people discussing. So anyways, hopefully now you have a little bit of the intuition as to what that discussion is actually about.